thank you for coming to the first of a six part series on uh, going global and, uh, and welcome. I'll introduce everybody in a minute. You're probably wondering who I am. I help run the International Business Accelerator. We catapult startups into the global growth and international expansion. And because LAVA, Los Angeles Venture Association, LABA is a sponsor here, or a host, I also chair the global committee of uh, the LA Venture Association. Uh, we have an online accelerator, um, and then for this event, we're launching a new global business canvas uh, to kickstart the path forward for those founders who are just putting their uh, their feet into the international marketplace. But as we always say, 75 to 80 percent of global purchasing power is outside the U.S., and really nobody should ever be content trying to go for 25 cents on a dollar. And we're going to learn from some experts <clears throat> about how to access that um, you know safely and efficiently and and quickly. So we, you know, I and, and the International Business Accelerator sit in a very interesting and we're grateful to be here as an intermediary or sometimes we say concierge um, to the LA ecosystem. We have a tremendous private sector and public sector and academic and policy leaders who really are supportive and collaborative. Uh, there's a lot of solidarity. Uh, I would say the solidarity drives uh, what we do and, and how we do it so well. Um, you know, everybody's asking the right questions of how to help. And we at the IBA are honored to, to be able to connect founders and business leaders with folks that you're going to hear from tonight. Again, private sector, public sector, uh, universities, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, folks like Milken and the policy side. So. You can hear from Andre, who runs an LA tech company. So he'll represent anecdotally today the private sector. So he's took a, a tech company into the EU and the UK. And he's going to talk about the speed bumps and the potholes and what he would have done differently. And he also leveraged some governmental support there too. Um, and see Christine from the mayor's office, if she is the director of international trade and, and investment. Imagine for a second what she has at her fingertips. She's the kind of expert and leader in our ecosystem that can make a suggestion that could easily accelerate your international growth by 18 months just by that one connection or hundreds of thousands of dollars in either savings or profit because she pointed out something uh, that, uh, that you wouldn't have known about. So we're trying to bring all of this expertise to the founders and the entrepreneurs and the leaders of LA. And I know we all have some fatigue for the Zoom calls and, and the virtual meetings, but this has really enabled us to bring all of the big thinkers and the heavies all together to give the founders and the entrepreneurs access to all of this. So we're excited to have you. And uh, you know, the goal here is to not only just learn here and now, but I will be compiling the anecdotes and the resources and the contact information and the programs um, from you know private sector like PayPal, who you'll hear from tonight, and then the mayor's office has a small business portal, which is uh, which is critical to know about as well. So uh, this is the first of of six series. So I'll send some information about the uh, following five and the different topics. So uh, some housekeeping here. I'm going to introduce Jake from the Global Innovation Forum. They're a DC-based entity, which um, Luckily for us, they see what we have here and the wealth and the opportunity of global trade and innovation here in, in LA. So the Startup Global Program is theirs. They've done it around the country, and this is the first time they've done a, a multi-series event. So he will talk to Andre in the interview style so you can learn about uh, Andre's trials and tribulations and successes of how he's done his international expansion. And then we'll go to the panel. And all the meanwhile, I will be putting information and contact inform information, as I said, in the chat. And please, by all means, keep it lively. However, if you have questions for the panelist or, or Jake, the moderator, uh, please put them in the Q&A section. And that way we can go through them and answer all the questions uh, that we have uh, building up. So um, <clears throat> thank you to Global Innovation Forum, the uh, International Trade Administration, uh, the US Commercial Service, particularly Terry Batch here, the, the local leader, um, LAVA, as I mentioned before, and uh, LMU Business School, a 
College of Business Administration. And uh, special thanks to Milken Institute for uh, hosting this. And uh, I will be back at the very end to wrap things up uh, and to once again let you know that I will be compiling all the data and the salient points and, and the interesting things that uh, you'll want to take away from this, and in particular the contact info. So with that, thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks everyone for being a part of it on the other side and I'll turn it over to you, Jake. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, really appreciate the chance to partner with you uh, on this Startup Global Series. I'm also grateful to partner again with our partners at the Department of Commerce. Um, so we at the Global Innovation Forum uh, launched this Startup Global uh, in partnership with uh, Commerce back in 2015 to emphasize the, the public and private sector resources that exist to be global. And so this series has been everywhere from Pittsburgh to Baltimore to uh, Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. Uh, and now really glad to, uh, for the chance to host these virtual events uh, with you in, in Southern California. Uh, and I think it's important to note that the U.S. government has a lot of resources available. Um, through the International Trade Administration and the Commercial Service, plus SBA, PTO, and the Exim Bank, among others. Um, I also, uh, you already uh, gave a shout out to Terry Batch, but I, I really appreciate everything that Terry has done. Um, she's a Senior International Trade Specialist with the Department of Commerce uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and so she's done a lot of work to put this series of events together. Uh, and in future events in the series, uh, you'll hear from her and several other government officials about those uh, public sector resources that are available. Uh, but tonight we're, re we're really focusing on the private sector. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Global Innovation Forum, uh, we're a nonprofit effort to explore the role of global markets in the success of small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, and so we work with corporate and government partners, uh, everyone from PayPal to the government of Australia to the World Trade Organization uh, to connect entrepreneurs with government officials to talk about how to improve access to the global marketplace. Uh, so I have the privilege tonight of, of managing two conversations. And so first, I'd like to turn and, and speak with Andre Leb of Protégé and then moderate a discussion with the Office of the Mayor of LA, uh, the Milken Institute and PayPal. Uh, so Andre, um, first, let's, um, I, let's you and I talk, if, if that's all right with you. Um, Protégé is a, an internet and media company that Andre is going to describe better than I can. But uh, among other things, uh, they run a series of rewards programs, including Swag Bucks, My Points, and You Promise. And so... Uh, Andre, it's great to meet you virtually um, and really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, you know, the, the session is about uh, solutions for tackling new markets. And so uh, you know, could you briefly tell us about your business and the importance of global markets to Protégé? Yeah, sure. Thanks uh, again, everyone, for having me. Um, the, you know, Protégé, like you mentioned, is a rewards platform. We bring together consumers and, and marketers through uh, our various websites. And uh, the way that translates into uh, a consumer is a, basically in, in a short, uh, let's say, sentence would be a cashback site. So you can shop at restaurants, you can shop online, offline, get points and then convert those points to rewards. Now we take all of that aggregate data and also offer marketing solutions to both agencies and brands. So uh, they can tap our users to ask them questions. They can look at aggregate data and make decisions on different products and pricing and strategy. So that's, that's what we do uh, at a very high level. And before we got funding, we realized that the proposition of cash back and getting points was a universal one. So we said, why don't we take this to other markets? Uh, so that, that was a sort of a, the naive uh, concept concept in the beginning and, and that's that's how I joined uh, that's when I joined Protégé to basically take it to other markets. Now I say it uh, I, I mentioned it's pretty funny because this was a startup within a startup so for those that are in that sort of startup mentality or, or with low funding uh, I, I want to highlight that because you can go international with, with little uh, um, you know resources let's say. So uh, you know, the concept is universal. Now, how do we, how do we take this to other markets? Um, the first thing, the first approach we took was to say, okay, well, this is an English product, a product that is in English. Why don't we open up in markets that also speak English? That's a, a easy uh, maneuver. So we went to Canada, UK, uh, Australia, and to this day, UK is, is the largest market for us outside the US. So that, that was uh, 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 both a necessary move because again, we didn't have the resources to, 
or in the translation and development needed to, to localize the product, but also one that made sense because the UK is a, one of the largest markets uh, outside of the US. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's how, that's, that was our approach. Um, now, looking back, I think I was even a little bit too conservative because when I look at companies like LinkedIn and Facebook, even Google, they all launched uh, globally. They were available globally in English. And I was always afraid to, to basically come out with our product in English uh, uh, to markets where that's not the first language. So uh, I would say looking back, I would probably be even more aggressive and just launch more markets and, and learn along the way. And that's actually what I did, uh, I did uh, after we launched the uh, eight markets with translation and localization, we then opened, uh, opened up everywhere. Uh, in English and people still appreciate what we offer. So, so that, that was a big lesson. Thanks, Andre. Uh, just one note um, going forward, if, if you can speak up, we got a little bit of feedback that, um, that some folks are having trouble hearing you. Um, so uh, there you are. Um, so I, second question, you know, as I speak with entrepreneurs and, and we start to look at um, some of the research that's starting to, to come out um, about COVID-19, um, there's a high correlation between the use of digital tools and survival or, or success um, amid the pandemic. Um, could you talk about how your business has been impacted positively or negatively by COVID-19? And, um, you know, what are some best practices? Can you describe some of the key digital tools that you rely on uh, as you manage this uncertainty and operate your business globally? Yeah. Uh... You know, COVID was a big shock. Uh, March and April, uh, we saw a lot of our business basically come to a halt. Um, not obviously not everything, but specific areas. We, in the market research side, we had clients who basically paused projects uh, or postponed at least. Uh, we had huge advertisers like Amazon and Walmart who said, people are not leaving the house. They're shopping, you know, online. Anyways, we don't need to advertise right now. We, we have more business than we can handle. So we had some pretty uh, stiff uh, uh, shocks, I would say, to our business. Um, now, all of that sort of worked itself out over time. Um, but uh, in terms of how we dealt with COVID, I, I would say uh, some tools that we had in place, but uh, were not necessarily as used as they are now, became extremely you know more important so obviously zoom went from a tool that we that i actually was the probably the biggest user because my team is in europe and i'm here in los angeles for me it was a common a tool that i use commonly became a company-wide tool now every meeting in the company became a zoom meeting um, slack became that much more important we have slack channels internally we have slack channels with companies that we do business with um, now one thing that I think was interesting is the sales process. You know, how do you go and sell during COVID, right? In the first few months, people are still in shock. You don't know if it's okay to talk to them. Is it okay to sell? Is it, a, is it too crass to, to even talk about business during, during that time? Uh, a lot of uncertainty. So, so we invested in uh, uh, learning tools for, us, uh, for our sales team. Uh, and we did, we did approach the two ways. One, we created a, what we call protege university. So this was just an internal, uh, uh, let's say course or, or presentation by different teams. So we can all learn about all of our existing products and new products coming down the pipeline. So we can become better salespeople. Um, and then as far as out, outside tools, we invested uh, in, uh, on LinkedIn specifically on Navigator as a tool for our, our sales team to connect with uh, potential prospects as well as LinkedIn Learning, uh, where they offer video courses to, um, on various subjects, anything from SEO to, you know, how to become a better manager. Um, so, you know, we've had, I would say we'd have mixed success with that. We have people who really like it and, and have watched a ton of content and others who barely touched it. So. Uh, but but we, we did want to make those resources available to our members, uh, or sorry, to our, our, our team uh, to make sure that even if they were not as busy selling, they could become better salespeople, better managers, and learn more about our product. 
So when we come out the other way, the other end, um, we, we can hit the ground running. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll throw in on, on the B2B side, which I think is interesting. I was very skeptical. Uh, a lot of the conference, we, we do a lot of business uh, through conferences. We have, you know, sponsorships, we have booths, um, and all conferences went uh, virtual. Some just canceled, others went virtual. And I have to say that the virtual conferences did actually work out for us. Uh, maybe because our salespeople were so eager to get out there, but, uh, you know, we made a lot of out, uh, contacts through these virtual conferences and that, that actually worked out for us. So I, I think, uh, you know, when, when you had no other choice, that, that was uh, the only option and, and people did want that connection, not just sales, but, the customers also wanted to be in touch with uh, the industry. So that, that was an interesting um, turn of events, I guess. Thanks, Andre. Yeah, I mean, you know, there is Zoom fatigue, but there's also a desire to keep connecting um, for, for business and, and personal reasons as well. Yeah, so. I, I'll, I'll throw just a quick story in because I think it could be unusual. I don't know, maybe some other folks tried this, but uh, I actually had made hires before COVID and in the UK and, and Europe in general, a lot of people have long uh, terminate, uh, not long notices when they leave a job. So I had people that I had already committed to who started in, on April 1st, on May 15th, uh, when most companies had frozen their hires. So, you know, how do I onboard a new, uh, a new uh, team member without see, meeting them in, or seeing them in person, without being able to have their teammates in, the, in London uh, host them in the office, take them out for a lunch. So we started a, a Zoom workout um, group. And uh, so we had the new team members join in and we would pick a YouTube video and just do exercises on Zoom. For me, it was early morning. For them, for it was the end of the day. And that, that was an interesting way to just kind of bond with uh, people at a more personal level and try to break this, uh, you know, Zoom fatigue. It was a more fun way of Zooming. Yeah, well, uh, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> right. Um, I, so I, I wonder, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned this, the fact that there are a number of government resources that are available to help uh, small businesses and startups. Um, are there any government resources or best practices that, that you've utilized or observed um, to help your business be global or to manage uncertainty during COVID-19? Um, so, you know, thinking of things like, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce's uh, commercial service offerings and, and gold key services or, or things uh, pandemic related like PPP? Yeah, so uh, we definitely, uh, uh, as a company, we, we did apply to PPP. Um, and I know a lot of companies who applied for the SBA loans. So, so those were extremely helpful um, and provided, even if, if, if anything, at least a layer of security and, and sort of a, uh, you know, to, to quell the uncertainty in a way, uh, both from, from company executive, executives and employees. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, we, we were able to basically weather this uh, the COVID storm without any layoffs. Uh, we did have a plan in place to, to obviously to, to address any changes in the business, but we were able to recover uh, fairly quickly and again without any layoffs. So, so that that's been a very exciting thing for us this year in this weird uh, 2020. Uh, looking back at uh, the beginning of my my journey, I think uh, uh, organizations like the UK Department of uh, International Trade were key. Um, you know, I, I didn't really actually I had never been to the UK before I, I joined Protege. So I had very little to go off of. I had a sort of a blank uh, canvas and, and, and connections like, uh, you know, uh, Mike McLuhan and, and, and the uh, Department of Trade uh, helped me plot, start plotting points and, and, and making these connections and then understanding each of the uh, unique uh, issues within each market. So, um, you know, through the UK Department of Trade, I, I was able to, find uh, uh, legal help, uh, you know, to set up company, to, to deal with privacy issues, hiring, labor laws, everything that, even though the UK is probably the closest to the US in terms of 
regulation. Uh, there's still nuances, and, and you just you just can't you know take your U.S. Uh, uh, paperwork and uh, apply it to 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 the U.K. or any other market. So uh, so that was key uh, to really get going, get our my first uh, first push into the market. Uh, one more thing that I don't know if they still do it, but at the time they offered the the, the touchdown program, which was a phenomenal service where it, you literally they help you with the the work visa, they find help you find office space, they set they basically help you set up a shop uh, within weeks, if not less than that. Uh, so that that's actually quite amazing. Thanks, Andre. Uh, well, so I, I could keep up this conversation for a long time, um, but I did want to say it's a great call out for the UK. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about US government resources. There are fabulous resources um, abroad as well. And so I know the UK has a strong presence um, through the Department of International Trade in California. Uh, they also have uh, something called London and Partners in, the, in uh, New York um, that helps inbound uh, companies looking to, to invest in the UK. Right. Um, and so it's always a good idea to um, to contact the the government that you're looking to do business with, um, as 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 well as the U.S. government. So right. um, that's a great call out. Uh, so I think unfortunately we have to leave the conversation there, and I'm going to turn um, to the panel discussion. Um, I saw a question come in through the chat, uh, but I, I think uh, that is at least as appropriate for the panelists as as for Andre. And so, uh, Andre, uh, really appreciate you taking the time, and and look forward to um, uh, to following up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'd like to now um, turn to the panel discussion and, and welcome uh, Aaron uh, Melas, who's the Associate Director uh, of the Center for Regional Economics with the Milken Institute, Christine Peterson, who's the Director of International Trade and Investment uh, with the Office of the Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, uh, and Paul Diffelkin, uh, who's a Senior Associate of Government Relations for PayPal. Um, so really appreciate all of you being here as well, um, and all of your organizations work uh, in one way or another with small businesses. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, what takeaways or lessons learned um, do you have about the role of global markets in digital trade uh, in small businesses' success uh, and amid, the co amid COVID-19 and their survival? Um, I, Christine, can we go to you first? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. Um, yeah, so from what we've seen of small businesses in um, international trade throughout COVID, it's, um, it's been tough. There have been declines in the international trade. Um, the, the steepest decline was in the second quarter of 2020, um, but I think that's starting to bounce back. And in LA County, compared to the nation, we have a lot more employees that are employed by small businesses than, um, than the nationwide average, so 82% of employees in LA are employed by small businesses compared to 47% um, nationwide and 48% statewide. So we know that small business is really important to our economic recovery and that's why we see international trade as an important piece of that recovery. Um, it's, it was an important piece during the global recession, uh, or excuse me, during the Great Recession um, back in 2008. And now we have this new, uh, relatively new phenomenon of e-commerce. And e-commerce has just grown so much over the past 10 years. It's really a great time to expand into cross-border e-commerce. And it's a great time to think about expanding globally because even though the projections are for um, contraction in consumer demand and global growth, in some areas of the world, GDP is still growing. So in East Asia and the Pacific in particular, um, the World Bank has said that there's still going to be growth there of, of, of between, depending on the, re, the, depending on the country, up to 3%. So um, you compare that to the United States where we're projected to contract by 6%. So you can see the importance of uh, foreign markets. When demand is low here, you can weather the storm better um, looking at uh, foreign markets. Yeah, that's for sure. Thanks, Christine. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, I, I think there's, there appears to be from our anecdotal evidence talking to, to entrepreneurs, but also some of the work that PayPal and, and others have done, um, just this high degree of correlation between digital literacy and being able to use these digital tools um, and 
global success, you know, the ability to access global markets and, and then um, survive and, and thrive because of it. Uh, so Aaron, same, uh, same question to you. Um, could you talk about uh, you know, some of the takeaways about the role of global markets in digital trade and small businesses survival? Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. Thanks again to the invitation to participate uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the Milken Institute. We're really excited about this dialogue. This is an issue we've been paying attention to for quite some time. Um, I think I'd say a couple of things. The first being that, <clears throat> excuse me, in, on the trade front, uh, it's, it's perhaps helpful to, to be mindful of the fact that there were a few disruptions when it came to trade policy, even before the beginning of the pandemic. So there was a fairly high level of uncertainty for, for small businesses that were looking to try to engage globally for the first time uh, as to you know, how to do that, what was going to be changing, particularly when it came to the U.S. trade relationships with China and with Mexico and Canada here in North America. Um, with respect to the point about uh, uh, digital tools, I think um, there was a survey by, I believe, the U.S. Chamber Technology Engagement Center. Uh, I think it was about a year ago, maybe two years ago. They pointed out that something on the order of three quarters of the businesses, small businesses they had surveyed at that time, were not aware of digital resources that could help them. That's everything from the e-commerce tools that we become much more accustomed to, uh, payment processing, uh, productivity tools. So I think uh, it's, it's been demonstrated that you know, small business in, businesses in particular have started to grasp much more fully than they ever have just how many opportunities these uh, tools can create, especially at a time when there are so many other challenges on the, on the trade front. Um, to that, I'd add that I, there's, I think, a shifting dynamic now where when we talk about digital tools and trade, we're moving beyond a discussion of digitally sold trade you know, using a website to sell your goods to more of a discussion about digitally enhanced trade, talking about the what, when it comes to what businesses can offer, how they can enhance their goods or their services uh, through digital offerings. And I think that's one area where we're starting to see a little bit more growth and, and hopefully there will be a fuller kind of policy discussion about those opportunities and how to support them moving through and coming out of the pandemic. Sorry, wasn't sure if you were finished or not. <laughs> um, thanks, Aaron. Um, Paul, uh, over to you. Same question, talking about uh, digital tools and, and global trade and managing uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think that we have seen how cross-border trade has just been a tremendous opportunity for small businesses. Um, and, you know, the advent of, of digital commerce um, and digital payments, you know, has really democratized that opportunity for small businesses. Uh, over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, a, a global pandemic a situation like we are in has just accelerated that trend. Um, and we've really seen um, the, the growth, um, you know, triple um, from what we, you know, expected um, to be by uh, the end of 2020 um, and really accelerated that growth by three to five years. Um, and you know, we, we've done some research in the past about how uh, small businesses um, on our platform that are exporting are growing at about 22% um, the rate of uh, businesses that aren't exporting, um, you know, opening up to new markets, new consumers. Um, and then, uh, you know, really just uh, the, the idea that, you know, a business because of digital commerce, no matter where they're located or how big they are, um, you know, can reach customers around the world, um, you know, with the ease of online transactions. Um, and we've seen that um, create opportunity for rural-based businesses. We've seen that create opportunity for um, female-owned businesses who have sometimes, um, you know, historically struggled to um, break into the global marketplace. Um, and, uh, and, and again, we've seen those businesses grow um, at, uh, you know, twice the rate of uh, traditional businesses that, that are not selling in global markets. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you know, it kind of comes back to this idea of meeting your customer where they are. Um, and right now customers are moving online. Um, and I think that we're not gonna see this regression back to necessarily the way things were, even when some of these lockdowns are lifted, we're really gonna see this, um, this ease of um, digital transactions um, really kind of permeate the, the culture. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we've seen, we've done some recent research about how digital small businesses 
are performing um, on the PayPal platform um, during sort of the height of these COVID lockdowns. And, um, you know, to uh, Christine's point about how, um, you know, small businesses still have this opportunity with digital commerce, even though, you know, some, um, you know, GDP, country GDPs are, are retracting. Um, 25, uh, small businesses on the PayPal platform actually saw 25% year over year growth in Q2, um, even though small businesses overall experienced a 9% drop in revenue um, during that same time period. Um, and, you know, I, there, there's also this idea of, you know, it's not too late to, to digitize, you know, it's never too late. Um, and we actually saw that the businesses that joined PayPal um, between March and June, um, you know, when, when all of these lockdowns were in place, actually performed better than existing PayPal businesses. They were able to ramp up very quickly um, and reach those customers um, right away. Um, and then the, the final thought that, that I'll share is from that research is that um, about 75% of the sales for these digital small businesses were outside of their own state. Um, and that includes outside of uh, their own country as well. So, um, you know, the being able to reach these customers all over the world, um, you know, has really helped these small businesses sustain um, and also thrive. Thanks, Paul. And I, I mean, just to point out that this is a global phenomenon as well. Um, and there are habits that are likely to stay even after the pandemic subsides. So, you know, we just put out a report um, where we surveyed others, um, and there was a study out there that found that 70, over 70% 70 of consumers surveyed in Kenya purchased groceries online for the first time. And, and a lot of that's, you know, omni-channel retail, it's, it's buying online and, and picking up in store. Um, but, you know, that's, that, that's um, a ton of change um, in, in being replicated in countries around the world. Um, I wanted to move on and, and talk a little bit more about challenges. Um, so, you know, for, for all three of you, uh, what would you say is, is the single biggest challenge uh, that you would flag for small businesses as they seek to expand their business globally? Um, and for that challenge, you know, how can a small business seek to address it? Um, Christine, can we go back to you? Sure. Um, well, I don't know if it's the single biggest challenge, but it's the one that I uh, have worked on the most and most familiar with, so I'm going to throw it out there. Um, but it's protecting your intellectual property rights. So um, prior to coming to the mayor's office, I did work for, for the International Trade Administration, the Department of Commerce, and also for the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative working on trade negotiations and the intellectual property provisions of those nego negotiations, of those trade agreements. Sorry. Um, so I, um, you just see over and over again that if a company isn't aware of the need to protect their, their brand through their trademark, their invention, through their patent, their creation, through their copyright or their proprietary information through trade secrets, that if they're not protecting those in each individual market that they're going out to, then they're really putting themselves um, at risk. So that's one of the one of the the I think the biggest challenges, and the good news is there's a lot of resources to help with that, and uh, I'm sure that's one of the topics later in this series. But if you want to get a head start, you can go to stopfakes.gov, where there's quite a lot of resources on protecting your intellectual property abroad. It's a great call out, and and thank you for mentioning we we are um, hosting this uh, an event on uh, specifically on intellectual property rights. Uh, on December 7th. And so hope you'll, you'll join us for that as well. Um, Aaron, how about you? Could you call out a, a major challenge for, for small businesses? Sure. Um, asking about the, the single greatest challenge is, is certainly a tough question, but one that I'll highlight and, and one that I've uh, had the opportunity to work on uh, quite a bit from the Milken Institute, as well as with Christina in the mayor's office through the LA Regional Export Council is um, sort of how to walk new to export firms through the various resources that are available to them. Um, it can be a fairly complicated web of agencies and acronyms and programs and uh, initiatives to engage them. And so trying to figure out where to begin for a lot of firms that are new, genuinely new to export can be uh, often a great challenge. Um, to, to that point, I do wanna put in a quick plug for um, a project and a report that uh, a number of my colleagues at the Milken Institute had worked on 
over the past couple of years. It's called the New to Export 101 initiative. Uh, basically, it was a pilot program uh, that had run here in Los Angeles, uh, working with about two dozen firms uh, that were interested in engaging uh, in, in export markets for the first time, providing them with some men mentorship services and, and helping them walk through uh, the full process of you know, how to export, you know, how to find the markets and the partners abroad, uh, how to understand the resources, the support services in particular that are available, uh, and then how to deal with questions like um, you know, regulatory differences between your products that you might be selling here in the US and how they might have to comply with different regulations abroad. Um, so that report is something I would absolutely recommend uh, that, that small business owners or, or founders take a look at. It's got some great, um, you know, explanations of what are the steps in the process. Um, we're in the process of sort of revisiting our findings from that project and, and seeing how we can update those to, to help firms, you know, navigate this, this system a, a little more efficiently going forward. So, um, yeah, to, to answer the, the initial question, just, you know, where, knowing where to begin is, is often the greatest challenge in, in this area. Yeah, for sure. And that's a great call out. Um, hopefully, Michael can include the report in the uh, takeaways that he sends around. Um, Paul, what about you? Uh, and I just, I said single biggest challenge. I just didn't want you to, to give me five or six challenges. What's, what's the most important challenge from, from your perspective? Yeah, um, well, I think that both of the things that have been raised already are, are crucial uh, to, you know, small business ability to, to trade globally. Um, one that I'll just highlight, since it hasn't been mentioned yet, is uh, access to capital, which, you know, I think is, is really something that small businesses uh, deal with, you know, globally all over the place, um, you know, whether they're, they're trading or not, um, uh, you know, that seems to be a major issue um, for small business success. Um, and it's something that, that we've tried to, um, you know, help small businesses with uh, around the world um, through some of our alternative lending platforms, um, PayPal Working Capital and PayPal Business Loans, um, which, uh, you know, sort of use different uh, criteria to assess um, a small business's creditworthiness. Um, and we found, you know, can increase a, a small business's likelihood to, to trade. Um, but just being able to get that additional capital to get that additional inventory um, or the additional <clears throat> the additional resources um, to take that step, um, I think is important. Also, one other that I'll just mention um, is uh, just because I, I've worked on this issue a lot in the past um, through, you know, positive policy change is lowering de minimis thresholds. You know, I think that for small businesses, um, being able to trade low value items without having to go through all of that rigorous paperwork um, is a huge step and a huge burden that is frankly intimidating for a lot of small business owners um, and something that I think that we can uh, do uh, to work together um, to try to change and, and correct so that um, you know, those de minimis thresholds um, don't stand in the way. Thanks, Paul. So I, I was actually gonna call out um, customs and trade facilitation issues as, as the most frequent barrier that I hear. Um, and so you, you touched on the de minimis issue, which is, you know, one part of, of a broader set of issues around uh, customs classification and clearance and, and getting your product, you know, across that physical border, which can often be uh, super challenging depending on the marketplace. Um, and it shouldn't be, uh, given the, the fact that there are electronic processes and, and uh, ways to kind of divorce the, um, the physical flow of the good these days from the transaction and the inspection that's, uh, that's needed. Um, Christine, you know, we had a, a follow-up question here in, in the Q&A uh, uh, from Marta. Um, she says she's, uh, she's a small publisher of books and IP theft is a huge mm -hmm. concern. Um, is there a report or a platform that we can watch to see what's going on uh, regarding IP theft in different countries? I know you already called out um, Stop Fakes, but uh, is there anything you can add? Uh, uh, yes, there is. So um, one annual report that comes out generally at the end of April is called the Special 301 Report. It's um, done with the State Department, with the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, um, the Department of Commerce, and it lists the, the worst actors around the world for intellectual property enforcement. And so there's a priority watch list of countries, a watch list of countries um, that perform slightly better, but you can see reading through the 100, paper, 100 pages or skipping to the countries that you're interested in exactly what are the issues and um, how, how well a country is doing with protecting or enforcing their, their intellectual property. Excellent. 
Thank you. Um, so my next question was going to be around, um, if, could you talk about uh, a private sector or government resource uh, that you would recommend to, to help uh, small businesses navigate global markets? I mean, Aaron, I know you, you already uh, listed one of yours, uh, but let's start with Paul because there's, there's a related question about this as well. And, and it's, uh, Johnny asks, how does a company join PayPal's e-commerce platform? And, and so maybe I would broaden that. Um, this is an opportunity for you to give a quick commercial on, on whatever you want related to PayPal. But um, I, I know um, PayPal has um, this kind of um, platform or partnership that allows uh, small businesses to, um, to globalize their, their business. And so, um, you know, wanted to see if you could maybe dig a little bit deeper on, on PayPal's offerings to, to small businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a marketing person, so I'm not going to do the, the hard sell on, on PayPal. Um, uh, but I do know that it's, it's extremely easy to set up a, a PayPal business account. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like I said before, you know, we've seen our, our small businesses ramp up very quickly um, and be able to reach global markets, um, you know, pretty much right away. Uh, we also do, you know, have a, a global sellers program, as, as Jake alluded to, um, that has the ability to, for merchants to, um, you know, get immediate price conversions on their website, um, have um, uh, language translation uh, so that it's in the, the local market language, um, and uh, also helps to, um, I believe, uh, it helps to with some discounted shipping offerings as well. Um, so, you know, some of the, uh, again, kind of going back to that, that barrier question, you know, one of the, the biggest struggles um, with uh, selling into other countries is, is that trust aspect. And, you know, we've done some surveys of, of consumers in the past and we found that, um, you know, seeing a product in your local currency or in your local language, you know, obviously will, um, you know, drive up that, uh, that shopping cart conversion that you're, that you're driving towards, you know, making sure that, um, you know, the, the uh, consumer is actually gonna, gonna check out. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, that's one of the things that we offer, but I know that there's a lot of um, really great public sector uh, resources out there as well um, that help to uh, connect into um, other markets and, and other consumers. Thanks, Paul. Um, Christine and, and Aaron, I, I know you already gave um, some resources, but do either of you uh, want to jump in about public or private sector resources that are available? Um, Christine, anything you want to say about uh, maybe from the mayor's office or the state? Yeah, I would just add, I mean, it does seem pretty overwhelming since we're talking about challenges, but um, about 95% of the exporters in the LA metro area are small businesses. So there's a lot of people doing it and they're doing it really well. Um, and there are, uh, there's really a wealth of resources in the LA area. We have incredible expertise and incredible trade infrastructure with the largest port in the Western hemisphere the third busiest airport in the world, um, and local offices of federal agencies that are here to assist you from the Small Business Administration, from the International Trade Administration, from XM Bank talking about financing. Um, but as Aaron was saying, sometimes it's hard to navigate all these resources. And so on the Small Business Portal, the Mayor's Small Business Portal, we do have a directory of those export support services, we have, um, because of COVID, we have compiled a lot of um, virtual export tools into a toolkit and an export media library. So I believe it was, it was Andre earlier talking about, you know, you can still work on your growth if, you're, um, if your uh, demands on your work time are low. So um, that's an excellent place to go. And then um, we've tried to organize the resources based on what stage you're at. So whether you're in the learning stage, if you're looking for markets, if you're looking for financing, um, the resources are organized in that way. Great, thanks, Christine. Aaron? Not much to add other than to say um, that, you know, many um, state and local chambers of commerce have great resources available. Um, I had the fortunate, or I had the fortune of, of talking to folks uh, from, from CIDO, from the State um, International Development Organization earlier this year, economic development agencies in, in all 50 states really that, that are involved in trade promotion, supporting local exporters. And, and there are, you know, great programs available at the state and local level uh, throughout the country. So 
starting with local chambers of commerce is often just sort of a good, uh, you know, maybe suggestion. Um, the other thing I'd recommend is, is reaching out, particularly via email to local AmChams. If there's a specific uh, country uh, where you're interested in doing business, where maybe you've gotten inquiries about your product or your service, uh, the AmChams um, often have great on the ground intelligence. Uh, they can maybe help fill in some of the gaps uh, you know, Christine had mentioned the special 301 report from USTR, which is a fantastic resource. But if you want to know a little bit more about, you know, some of the, the nuances of what it's like to work in overseas markets, um, you know, using, using the, the technology connections we now have available to us to connect with people who are working in those markets on a day-to-day -day basis is a great way of figuring out, you know, whether you, have, you may have a path forward. And I would say, um, you know, one of your first stops should really be to the uh, U.S. the foreign the U.S. Commercial Service uh, office nearest to you. And so there's a great one uh, in L.A. And and you know we have we have Terry Batch online. And we've we've given her a couple of shout outs now. But um, they have them all around the country. Uh, and then they through them have access both to Washington D.C. and and also to uh, many embassies abroad um, where the the foreign where the commercial service has um, has uh, diplomatic officers stationed there. Um, and so they're, they're often great um, kind of one-stop shops that can then um, provide advice about where else to go um, in your community or, or abroad. So I uh, highly recommend them. Um, so there's a, another question here from Lamont. Um, is there any protocol, you know, diplomatic or regulatory uh, or digital training that could assist with nuances that are critical to, um, to doing business internationally? Um, Christine, that, that sounds, I mean, I, I don't know that, if you have any ideas there, but I um, wanted to see maybe turn to you first. Um, I think I think Aaron's suggestion about the AmChams is really good. Um, you know, we live in a city where we have the third largest consular corps in the world. So um, definitely reach out to the consulates here. They're here to help you. Um, they've been they've been really excellent. And then it, we are a very global city too. So. Um, with a population that's 35% foreign born and a population that speaks over 220 languages, there's a good chance that um, your friend, your neighbor, someone in your, uh, on your team has some experience. So I, there's just a great wealth of um, global connections and experiences um, right here, I think. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I would say too, I, I mean, to Christine's point, there are a number of um, foreign uh, sort of delegations that come not only to Washington and New York, but uh, to LA and Silicon Valley as well. I, I know the UK has a uh, um, SBC to UK program uh, that they've developed. And so they, they bring um, uh, folks, entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley and, and the UK back and forth uh, to develop networks. Um, there are also great um, kind of nonprofit networks that, that we work with um, that can help um, train uh, to do business internationally. And so, I mean, Vital Voices is a, is a very particular one that, that we um, have worked with a lot in the past, um, and, and they're terrific. Um, now, they, they, tend, they, uh, they focus specifically on uh, empowering women entrepreneurs, um, including in developing countries, but um, they, they do have a, a fantastic network in, in North America as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, highly recommend them uh, and, and others like them as, um, as um, kind of opportunities to, um, to get to know peers and, and advisors. Jake, if I can, I did want to add um, sure. one other uh, entity that we hadn't talked about much, um, our community colleges. Um, they're a tremendous resource throughout the country, particularly for, you know, training in areas like e-commerce, uh, marketing, you know, a lot of aspects of, of running a business, regardless of whether or not you're looking to do it internationally. Um, here in, in LA, we've had the privilege of doing a bit of work with uh, the CITC uh, based down in, at the community college in Long Beach. I know that a number of, of entities throughout the community college system, as well as the Cal State system, have pretty strong programs in place for some of that training uh, to, to help businesses prepare to, to work abroad. So, so I'd also encourage people to, to look into, you know, the public resources that are available uh, educationally. And Andrew um, has uh, given a shout out to uh, the SBDC. Uh, and so he put the website down in, in the chat, southbaysbdc.org. Uh, the Small Business Administration have a, has a series of SBDCs around the country. Uh, and so um, for the, the one in, in uh, Southern California, go to uh, southbaysbdc.org. 
Um, there are a couple of other questions in the chat. Some of them are pretty specific, um, but I did want to uh, give you all a chance to respond. Um, you know, Lamont also asked, uh, what, would, what advice would you offer to healthcare and, and pharmacognitive consultancy startups um, with regards to regulatory due diligence given current challenges? Uh, maybe I would broaden it out a little bit to say, um, you know, what advice would you have to a company in um, a regulated industry? Um, because there's everything from education to electronics to healthcare um, where you are, um, you are faced as a company with more regulatory challenges than if you're selling, you know, a widget overseas. Um, what advice would, would you all have uh, to, to those companies that are heavily regulated um, and where those regulations might be different internationally than they are here? Um, I'll take whoever wants to jump in on that first. Christine? That is a tough one because um, it's not an area that I've worked on very often, but um, you know, you have to know the local laws and regulations of the country that you're going to do business in. And some countries, uh, you know, some of those regulations aren't even done at the national level. They're done at the provincial or state level. So sometimes you have to dig down even deeper. Um, the, the World Trade Organization does have a requirement to notify certain regulations. So a lot of that information is compiled on the, the World Trade Organization's website. Um, but it, it is quite a lot of information to go through and, um, and it, it always helps to, to have help, whether that's through um, someone who's on the ground, the embassy, um, whether the commercial service or an econ officer to help you navigate the, the local environment, as well as, um, again, the AmChamps or, or local business organizations. Jake, I have a, I have a suggestion. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, specifically, well, we're in Los Angeles, so it's such a big metropolitan market that there are trade organizations and groups for almost every sector. So in this case, I mean, just this week, I've had conversations with uh, Bioscience LA, and they're an organization uh, that exists to answer those questions and make those matchmaking, you know, uh, or introductions, or just a, an introduction to the entire ecosystem based on what, uh, what the needs are. So, you know, for this question, uh, there's no chat today, so I can't jump in, but David Whalen is the executive director and he handles life science and bioscience and he knows all the regulation and all that. So, and I would say that's the same for every sector. Well, you can, you can put it in your takeaways. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, yeah, I would say, I mean, to, to Christine's point, I, I think it, um, this speaks to the importance of finding, identifying good partners on the ground because um, you're going to need legal representation. You're going to need, um, you know, some, someone on the ground who can give you advice um, if you're in a regulated industry. Um, and it's not always as expensive as, as you might think. I mean, we've gotten to know um, a, a lawyer who um, set up Wilson Sonsini's um, UK office. And so uh, he's a great guy, Dan Glazer, and um, he's, he provides relatively low cost legal services um, to a bunch of startups um, in, in LA and, and the United States uh, in the hopes that you know, some of them make it big and, and they become bigger clients, but um, they are legitimately affordable services and, and he's not the only one. There, there are a bunch of attorneys that don't work on a, a big retainer business model these days. And so um, I, I think you, know, that's, you find one in the, in the area that you're regulated in and, uh, and you have to go from there. Uh, Aaron or Paul, did you want to uh, add anything? One thing I can perhaps just quickly chime in on is um, emphasizing uh, not so much uh, an answer to the question of where uh, to go for help with due diligence as the importance of making sure that you set aside time and resources to due diligence. Um, in a prior life as a consultant working with companies that were both uh, exporting as well as investing abroad, you know, producing things in other countries. Um, a lot of issues uh, lately around things like packaging and plastics have become, uh, you know, really hot button political topics. And so it is important for companies, particularly that are engaging internationally for the first time, to take some, some of their time, some of their resources to make sure that they're not you know, going into countries without any knowledge of local laws, local regulations, and essentially how the ground might be changing a bit underneath their feet. Um, so I know that's not so much a, a direct answer to the question as to reinforce the importance of it, but, but I think it is useful uh, you know, to, to keep in mind when it comes to you know, selling your products abroad, whether you might be affected by things that are not necessarily regulations of your industry specifically, so much as how your products might be sold. 
That's a really good call out. All right, so um, if the three of you were advising uh, the Biden-Harris administration, what are what is the one thing that you would tell them about how governments can help small businesses um, go global or manage uncertainty during COVID-19? You know, what's the what's the thing that you think uh, that governments can do better uh, in order to help small businesses succeed globally? Paul, you want to start? Well, you know, I think that. Um you know, one of one of the things right off the bat is what we were just talking about, you know, how difficult it is to, you know, find those resources, um, you know, to sort of figure out what the um, local regulations are, um, you know, and, and just what it takes to enter different markets with different um, policies and, and regulatory frameworks, um, making those sorts of um, things more readily available and more easily accessible, I think is, um, you know, a huge opportunity. Um, and then, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about access to capital, I think that we saw a really interesting, um, uh, you know, use case with the Paycheck Protection Program for um, a model of how public and private partners, public and private sectors can work together and partner um, to easily facilitate um, capital to small businesses. Um, uh, you know, I, I know that PayPal and another, a number of other uh, fintech companies were uh, involved in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and I think that, um, you know, using those sorts of government programs and government funding, um, but channeling it through um, some of the companies that are set up to, you know, easily facilitate those, uh, those funds to, you know, traditionally underserved um, or hard to reach segments of uh, the small business population um, is key. And I think that now, especially now, as we start to see, um, you know, what it's going to take um, to come out of this, you know, COVID economic crisis, um, you know, a lot of the um, traditional small business lending market is going to retract a little bit um, and not be as readily willing to lend. So that makes these government programs to provide capital even more important. And what small businesses really need are these flexible um, you know, either extremely low interest or just direct grant type uh, funding vehicles um, to, uh, to sustain their businesses and, and get that opportunity to go global. Thanks, Paul. So um, this is um, a good chance to, to say that next Monday, um, we're going to have a, uh, the next uh, iteration of Startup Global will have um, a conversation specifically on uh, access to capital and, and financing. And so you'll have Intuit and, and uh, a couple of other banks and uh, small business uh, government, government officials um, who will speak on that. So hope you'll join us for that. Uh, Aaron, do you want to say something? Sure. Um, I certainly do want to echo Paul's point about access to capital. Trade finance is, is already, uh, you know, a fairly complicated um, industry to navigate or, or process uh, to, to figure out for a lot of exporters. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, from a think tank perspective, I'll perhaps zoom out a little bit more and and in the bigger picture, encourage the, uh, the incoming administration to um, be a little bit more careful, a bit more thoughtful about the implications of some of the unilateral steps that have been taken, particularly with respect to how tariffs are applied. Um, I think that there are you know, a lot of questions that, that exporters are facing now uh, and small businesses have been directly affected by um, that are really you know, a, a product of the uncertainty. Um, that we've been dealing with for a few years. Um, I think it'd be helpful to have a, a more holistic view of how trade policy uh, affects not just, you know, large exporters, multinationals, but how it, you know, trickles down uh, and does affect small businesses uh, throughout the country. Um, and so I think it'd be, be helpful to, to approach a trade policy that's, um, you know, more sort of directly invested in um, creating market opportunities abroad and, and a bit less invested in, um, you know, taking unilateral steps uh, that, even as secondary effects uh, make it harder for, for small businesses to export. Well, I would just say it's not just the unilateral steps, but the sort of capriciousness of the unilateral steps. I mean, it's the uncertainty um, that seems to be a feature rather than a bug of, of, the, of trade policy right now. And so, you know, we've heard from a number of small businesses that um, you know, not only does it affect their bottom lines because of tariffs, but it also, I, <laughs> we talked to one um, software company from Baltimore and, and she said, look, I go up to Canada and I have to spend the first 45 minutes of the conversation telling them why we're still a trusted supplier. Um, and that's, that's not good for, for anyone's business. So um, 
all that to say, I completely agree with you. But um, if, Christine, if I mean, I would, would I'm sorry, go ahead. Briefly, just that, um, you know, what, I think there are perhaps a few sort of bright spots where there isn't necessarily as much action needed. Um, getting USMCA in place uh, certainly eliminated a lot of the uncertainty that, that had been sort of over everyone's heads for a few years. Uh, and I would certainly encourage people, you know, to look into some of the very good reporting, some of the very good analysis of just how focused that agreement was specifically on small business and on digital trade. I think there are some some valuable steps that have been taken in that area already. Agreed. Christine? Yeah, I think both of those points are um, very well taken, both the, the financing. I mean, companies need to survive uh, first and foremost. And so... I think there's going to need to be more funding for, for small businesses at the local level. We've been doing that too through the LA COVID fund um, and there will be subsequent rounds of that. Um, and uh, so yeah, survival certainty, as Aaron was saying, um, infrastructure investment in our, our trade infrastructure and access. I think just expanding access to tools, to um, trade financing, um, and, and opportunities. Thanks, Christine. Um, so Christopher has a question for, uh, for Paul, I think. You know, it says, throughout the years that PayPal has been here, what were some struggles that you have faced? Uh, and were those struggles frustrating to handle? I, um, I'm not sure if you can speak for the, the whole of PayPal on this, but uh, uh, any thoughts there? Um, interesting. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that one of the um, one of the biggest struggles, um, I think, leading up to uh, you know the the most recent you know last couple of months, is um, just being able to educate um, small businesses on on what uh, you know PayPal has to offer. You know, I think that you know, like we've talked about a lot uh, tonight. Um, you know, there are. Um, a lot of opportunities out there and sometimes it's hard to wade through all the noise to figure out what's out there and um, you know just making small businesses aware that you know we're here to help uh, and um, you know that that digital commerce can can be a real um, a real benefit um, you know has has been you know a, a little bit of a difficulty but I think that uh, the latest trends that we've seen towards digitization um, is uh, is really being a, a positive force for entrepreneurs all over the place. Great, thanks very much, Paul. Um, so Michael, that, uh, that comes to the end of the questions that I have. I, I think uh, from my perspective, just I really appreciate the opportunity to partner um, with all of you and, and thank you for taking the time. Um, we'll, uh, maybe we'll see if we can get uh, one of our resources. We just did a paper on lessons learned from COVID-19 um, for e-commerce. Uh, and so I uh, would love to maybe circulate that uh, when, when Michael uh, sends his note around. Um, but you know, wanted to, to thank uh, Christine, Paul, uh, Aaron, and, and Andre before that. For, uh, for joining us for this. And, and Michael, i uh, just uh, send it back to you and uh, look, looking forward to the next discussion. Yeah, uh, you as well. Thank you, Christine, uh, Aaron, Paul, Andre, good to see you again. Um, well, I, I think you, you know you put together a good panel and you don't want to talk after them, <laughs> all the genius and the wisdom that, that has uh, flowed over the last hour. Um, there, there was no chat, so I, I didn't put some of the information I planned on it, but to all of you viewing, we're going to do five more of these, <clears throat> so I implore you to share the information and spread the word with the other founders uh, and entrepreneurs in the circles in which you travel. Next week's going to be a, a great one. We've talked a little bit about the funding, um, you know, led by Paul, and I also, you know, I don't want to crush. Uh, Christine's inbox, but the city itself acts as a lender, and I'm not talking about the, just the COVID, uh, <clears throat> the COVID fund. But uh, you know, for startups in LA, you have what it banks that for character collateral and um, um, credit. So a lot of startups don't have all three uh, that a normal bank would want. So the city itself can take the risk that other traditional banks can't. Um, so I know we've gotten our clients some, some funding from the city really interesting terms so uh, that is next week next monday uh, so it's finance and funding sources 
uh, followed on the 23rd by e-commerce and digital strategy, which we've heard is uh, obviously critical and growing. Um, the following week in November 30th, and remember these are all Monday evenings, is uh, what we call Thrive in Country. So what is it you have to look for and be prepared for when you go into that market? You know, when Andre goes into the UK, what does he need to know and have in place uh, in order to, to find success there and thrive? Um, and then we'll take a week off. Actually, no, we don't, sorry. December 7th is the IPR, intellectual property rights. Um, Christine gave us a, a good intro into that. Uh, obviously it's critical. You could work as hard as you want. If you lose your shirt at the end of the day, it's, more, it's not worth it. So uh, IPR, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about the tremendous resources the US government provides uh, for, for founders and entrepreneurs. And then the last one, we'll do um, a deep dive, sort of a workshop style of uh, bringing together all the resources of what you would need to create your export strategy, uh, soup to nuts, A to Z for your company. So uh, those are the following Mondays. So please um, share it with, uh, with your friends and your entrepreneurial colleagues. And uh, I'll send you all this information as a follow-up. So thanks again to everybody. Jake, great job. Gentlemen, Christine. And of course, Terry Batch once again. <laughs> So with that, we'll see you next week.